Today I'm going to be reading the story The Gateway from the book, which is also called The Gateway, which is by Premasuda Janet Hobbs, me, um, and it's available on Amazon.com, Kindle. The story The Gateway is all about the beginning of the spiritual journey and also what it's like to proceed on the spiritual journey. It's written as a metaphor or a fable and it's a way to put words to some of the things that are hard to put words to that everybody experiences on the journey and the reason I wrote this book, this story, was it was towards the beginning of my journey and it just bubbled up uh, and asked to be written and it's about never giving up no matter what and about all the tricks our fear plays on us, our, the fear of our ego plays on us to try to get us to st steer away from the journey, to go back to the, you know, to our conditioning and uh, never dare ask for freedom again. So I hope it, I hope it's interesting and helpful and that it gives you strength. Okay, here it goes. Once upon a time, both today and long ago, in a magnificent country and in an ancient time, which really is now as well, there was a beautiful gate. It was a luminous gate, a gate of great promise. Indeed, it was a magical gate. It was a gateway to the land where dreams come true. The promised land, the kind of place we all know deep in our hearts really exists. Only the truly sincere made the journey to this gate, which embodied some of the most exquisite carvings and most precious materials known to mankind. The way was often long and arduous, and at times terrifying and lonely. But for thousands of years, probably since the origins of humankind, brave souls had traveled from far away to knock at this gate of dreams come true, simply because great treasure of the awakened heart called to them as it always will. The problem was, if it can truly be called a problem, was the guardian, the ugly and terrifying guardian at the gate, who delighted in turning people away from their dreams. He had had a lot of practice doing it. You see, people came from the world all over to knock at the gate of the dreams come true. Often they had struggled for so long and suffered such heartbreak just to find the gate. It would have touched your heart to have seen them. But the guardian's treachery was unsurpassed, for just in that moment of greatest hope, just as the hands reached up to knock on the gate, the guardian drowned the individuals in feelings of inadequacy. And hatred whispering in the deepest recesses of the heart, words that were terrified were true, that they were unworthy of their soul stream. No longer able to knock, the seekers pleaded with the guardian to open the door, but their own distrust had double bolted it. How the guardian relished his victories, for he knew if a seeker ever made it to the gate only to turn away, fear and bitterness followed. Some came searching for good fortune. Some asked for children to grace their lives. Some wanted fame or their soulmate. Many wanted political or religious freedom. Some wished for self-expression, the freedom to create. Many asked to be happy. Some came on behalf of their children. Perhaps the, the wisest simply wished to serve the great spirit here on earth and children not too. People came in all shapes and sizes. They came in all nationalities and at all levels of commitment. Some knocked only once, for at the first so sounds at the door, the guardian took on his full and desperate ugliness, reveling in his mastery of fear and the power it gave him. It took a very strong soul to keep knocking while the guardian was up to his tricks. Some turned away, perhaps many did. Some persevered knocking two or three times, more able to withstand the ridicule, the hatred that the guardian used to demean and to destroy. For he had an uncanny ability 
to undermine the natural self-worth and dignity that is human birthright. Whatever fear or doubt a person labored under, he would exaggerate until the individual gave up the search for an expanded life. Indeed, when these more courageous souls turned away from the gate of grace, all of heaven mourned. The most valiant kept knocking, and for these strong souls the guardian produced his full arsenal. He dredged up all their mistakes, real and imagined, and presented them as unforgivable, irrevocable sins. He held up to their faces a dark, twisted mirror that reflected back only ugliness. Blind to their own divinity, it didn't take much for the pointed finger of the guardian's blame to disembowel their faith, leaving them helpless and alone, at least for a while. Whatever it took to turn an individual back from his soul dream, the fearmeister did. He planted fears of mental instability and made taboo the deepest glimmerings of the seeker's heart. He replayed memories of unrequited love and unanswered prayers. He made the seeker's worst nightmare seem to come true, anything to turn the person away from the gate. Always there was something impossible about what was demanded, a choice that seemed impossible to, to make. Just decide to see no evil. You can do it. Nobody will know. A government employee, an honorable person, but 18 months from retirement was asked to look the other way. Grin and bear it. You've got responsibilities now. A new father of twin girls was told. He was told he could enjoy financial stability if he just numbed out and lived mechanically. Focus on your own needs, a busy careerist was told. When you dream your children are really neglected street urchins, remember it's just a dream. There's nothing you can do, so forget it, the guardian told a teacher of a nine-year-old who died of heart failure getting off the school bus. She knew in her heart that if she admitted the loneliness and neglect that had led to his death, she would have to leave her job at the monolithic school. You just can't handle it. A writer heard she risked mental stability if she truly wished to witness the truth about society's way of life. She was young and a mother. Only the guardian knew for sure that if the individual surrounded all, surrendered all control and let the difficulties be solved by the great spirit, the gate had to open. No matter how impossible it all seemed. Some refused to turn away and stood terrified by the guardian but trusting that God did exist. They said all their troubles just melted away and it was a melting that seemed to open the gate. More would have made it through, but years of being ground down, years in ten soulless schools, years in families too busy to love, and years in cement cities, cut off from the rhythms of Mother Earth, simplified the guardian's task. Lies and casual brutality fed the guardian. He feasted on wars and famine, racial discrimination and corruption in governments. Oddly, most helpful to the guardian were the deep feelings of hopelessness entertained by so many and by divisions in families. Whatever it took to turn souls back from their life dreams, the fearmeister did it. He hated life on earth. One day, a woman knocked at the gate her love for her children had brought her. She had come to save them and herself from the numbed and vacant life of the fearful soul that was so heartbreakingly widespread. In the illumination of love's gentle clarity, she knew the most powerful gift she could give was to go through the gate and assist others through too. She knew her children would go through with her effortlessly, matter-of-factly as children do, to the peace and freedom on the other side of the gate. And so she knocked in courage and full awareness of what she was doing. The guardian sprang into action. He focused on her greatest strength and her greatest vulnerability, her love for her children. His art of manipulation reached new heights as he bombarded her with images of their distress and wounding. Still she knocked, knowing it was all a lie even as her human heart pulled back in fear. The 
calmed herself, she began to sing sweet songs of God, gentle songs of faith and trust, and she continued to knock. Then the guardian became a harsh parent under whose spell she had labored for many years. The old murderous energy, the old ridicule and emotional blindness again came forward, scarring her heart again as she began to feel that old desperate abyss where she had once lived. Still she knocked, and as she knocked, she sang, and suddenly she began to see. So when the guardian became a lava mountain, the woman recognized the anger that had seared her soul. When he threatened poverty and early death, the woman witnessed her distrust and allowed it to be healed. And when he sent scorn, the woman saw its lie. So when fears for her children plagued her body and her mind, her heart's awareness became far bigger than even these, until at last she saw the Fearmeister's gift. What he offered all who reached the gate was a great opportunity to face their fears and leave them behind. The moment the woman realized the guardian too was ultimately serving love, she surrendered to joy. Immediately the door opened and the guardian fell into her arms, freed by her recognition that he had indeed provided a vehicle to face fear finally and completely. And as they embraced and gave thanks, thanking even the fear for ultimately serving love, there came a tremendous crack as something very powerful was dislodged and broken. What had melted was the powerful withhold that had settled over the earth, an energy which had stopped people from knocking, that had made them even doubt the very existence of the promised land. So after that, many souls made it through to the gate, to the land where dreams come true, where the only real power that exists is love. And heaven came to earth and miracles occurred and souls blossom. Now, really this story talks about the process of the seeker learning how to face the fear that they carry within themselves um, inside their own ego. You know, around two, all of us have egos. We get egos. They form. And they form on the child's um, insecurity and fear and their separation from their own soul you know the child you know we have to be imprinted to and and form egos to live our lives so the as children we leave behind our great innocence and our great connection to our soul and so and then we live our lives and we can go round and round in conditioning or we can decide to return to that innocence regain the innocence that we once had and this story is about the process of doing that and it is a keep you know knocking at the door saying you know I want my freedom and then fear will you know come up and in our lives it will seem like that that we're you know that we're not worthy of it that we're not worthy of our dreams coming true that we're you know too flawed and then we you know but if you keep going what happens is you start moving into truth and so you become, you know, uh, your understanding gets bigger, fear gets less. And, you know, it is possible to do that all the way to self-realization. And at that point, um, at self-realization, um, there is this the union of opposites that occurs. It's the union of the male and the female. So in a woman, it would be a union with her male subconscious and in the, in the man, it would be a union with his female subconscious. And then that starts off uh, a blossoming. Uh, Carl Jung calls that a sacred, sacred marriage. And, and then the personality really blossoms in who they were born to be. But again, with the journey in the story, you know, the woman who's knocking, she's thrown back on herself. So, you know, when the guardian you know, she knocks on the gate and the guardian greets her and she starts seeing, you know, this, the, the lava mountain that she saw in him was actually in her and it was her own anger. Um, 
So we, we, we do have to be thrown back on ourselves and, and, and self-purify in order to proceed on the spiritual journey because often, you know, we think we're like, um, you know, angel food cakes, but we, we, we have a dark side too. So we're more marble food cakes <laughs> and, and you have to clear your own darkness before you can reach self-realization, but it is possible to do it. Um, in the West, we, you know, we've, we, our culture is more uh, materialistic. Um, so it's maybe not such a well-known concept, but in the East, they have, they've had thousands of years of this spiritual tradition, and it is understood there that self-realization um, is a possible uh, choice in life. And as I said in other videos, the Hawaiians call such a person the companion of God. Okay, so I hope this helped, and thanks for listening.